All right, special treat, folks. You asked and you receive. Back and better Ooh. than ever. Rick and Tom, baby. Oh, yeah. oh there you, you go. Tom Jones. Rick and Tom, baby. Those were the days. Yes, sir. These are, what do you these mean? are those, the days. Those were, these are the days. Are you right. We are the men, and we are back, and it's great to have you on, as always, especially to talk sports, which we don't get a chance to do like we did in the office every day. That's that, true. That, that makes it better because this is all you know fresh. We don't. I don't know what you're thinking. You don't know what I'm thinking. But we're going to wade into it uh, over these next two days a little bit. And uh, I, I want to start which, with what I think is just something that has evolved maybe unexpectedly, but you talk about mushrooming in popularity. And I think it's forever changed, and that is – the women's basketball game, and in particular because of Caitlin Clark and then Angel Reese with LSU, and that rivalry, which in and of itself um, was worthy, you know, of watching the rematch as they met in the national championship game a year ago. But let's start with the ratings, Tom. You used to do oh media all the time. You're used to seeing yes. numbers. Okay, twelve point three million viewers, more than last year's national championship game, and and this is where it really got me. More than the NBA Finals, more than any regular season college football game except Ohio State and Michigan during the entire season, more than the World Series. I mean, more than more than the final round of last year's Masters. Yeah, which is a huge deal. Absolutely, always. and I know there. I know there's you know a list that that's even longer than this, but I mean just just think about the importance we place on all those events and how much money television spends, you know, to broadcast those rights, um, you know, championship games throughout the year. And um, for one basketball game, a singular basketball game, a women's game to draw 12.3 million viewers, it's it's just, it's incredible. And it speaks to, in my opinion, uh, you know, rare talents, obviously, but also sort of what I think is an evolving level of play uh, in women's basketball. Now, maybe maybe it's been there. I don't know. But you have what I think you know people are calling sort of a unicorn in Caitlin Clark. And some people are comparing her to Steph Curry, who changed the NBA, right, with his three-pointers from the logo. And, and, and now, you know, the game, the game has taken that on. But I've never seen – many players, men or women, that could impact the game as many ways as she did. 41 points, 12 rebounds, and or 12 assists and 7 rebounds. And she makes everyone better. She has this, you know, Mamba mentality that, that you've seen from other great athletes throughout the years. Um, what do you make of the popularity? Is it is it a singular rivalry? Is it what happened playing off of last year? Last year's ratings were, I think, 10 million. So... Yeah. So the thing that surprised me about this year was when when we realized there was going to be a rematch between LSU and Iowa. Yeah. And we all got excited because remember what happened last year was one of the, the highest rated games ever uh, and certainly the highest rated game before um, in the ESPN era. But here's the thing. When I saw this game coming out, I said, this is going to be a Monday night. The game's going to be on ESPN as compared to last year's national championship game which was on ABC. Now, there's a huge difference even today between cable and network TV. So I thought this game this year, it's going to get a good, it's going to get a good number. It's, it might approach the 9.9 million that they got a year ago, but I don't think it's going to get quite there. And then to see that the number came out was 12.9 million. And I was absolutely, it peaked at like 16 million at one point. Mm. And I was blown away by it. By the way, it's it's not only the most watched women's game uh, on ESPN, and I, the most watched women's game, I believe, since the national championship game in 1983 between USC and Louisiana Tech, which, by the way, had a guard. By yeah, the they did. Kim Mulkey was on yeah, they team. did. Who I saw so, play that very year. Or actually, it's actually two years. Scrappy little oh player. My God. Nice player. Unbelievable. Uh, you see the way she coaches? She was more maniacal as a player. You couldn't stop her. <laughs> I mean, she she Absolutely. was she was mouthy. She was in everybody's face. She dove all over the court, and it didn't matter that she's not close to the tallest player, but she dominated right. co- uh, women's basketball. 
And so I, I, I think just the fact that that many people got involved this year, and you're right about Caitlin Clark. You know, I have a, my favorite stat in all of sports, in sports history. I have a favorite stat. My favorite stat is this, that if you took Wayne Gretzky's goals away, if you didn't count any of Wayne Gretzky's goals, and you just counted his assists, he would still be the highest point producer in NHL history. If you don't even count his goals. Just... Oh, and by the way, he has more goals than anybody, too. Yeah. But if you just count his – he had more assists than anybody else had goals and assists in NHL history. My second favorite stat, I think, is this year – Caitlin Clark became the all-time Division I scorer, men or women, in NCAA history, Division I. And she also led the nation in assists. Mm. Like, that's remarkable when you think about it. To not only be somebody who can put up 40, 41 points a game, but also dish out 12 assists. And as you mentioned a minute ago, make everyone around her better. Look, there have been great players. Rick, you've seen them. Diana Taurasi, Sue Bird, Cheryl Miller, which we played in that game against Kim Mulkey back in 83. Um, Rebecca Lobo absolutely was a sensational yeah. player. So there have been great players before Caitlin Clark, mm-hmm. just as there were great players in the NBA before Steph Curry. But these are transformational, uh, formidable players. Like they have changed not only the way the game is played, the way we watch the game. And the thing, Rick, that I was blown away with in this game Monday night, I watched it. I was just like, there are a lot of games where a player will. It, it's like, okay, this is the moment. If you're a great player, you're going to step up in this moment. And if she had come out on Monday night and scored 25 points and had 12 assists, we'd be raving about Rick. She was shooting from practically half court. Oh, yeah. Like she looked like Kurt. Oh, yeah. And I have so much respect for players who rise to the occasion Mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to take over this game. And LSU played fine. Like Angel Reese had it. You can make an argument. First half, Angel Reese was the the best player on the court. And. I thought I thought you put it perfectly, Rick. Like, I think she has changed the game in such a way that it changes the way, not only the way that it's played, but the way we perceive it. I, I'm I'm blown away by how good she is. It's hard to believe that on the I guess Neanderthal level, there used to be people, and you know them, Tom, that would say, "I love basketball. I love women. I hate women's basketball." You know, like it, yeah, it's the right, most sexist right. thing you could say. Um, but in watching these athletes, and they, I mean, they the athleticism of these women now, um, you know, are they playing above the rim? Not all of them. Some can, you know, there, there's women that can dunk in college, college basketball and in the WNBA. Um, but they play the game. They play a game that we were used to seeing kind of growing up, right. Um, where you share the ball, where everybody has movement when you can elevate, like, I don't know. I, I don't have any way to judge the other four starters on Iowa's team. I know they have numbers, I know they got to be pretty damn good. Um, my guess is if, if they were out there, you know, in the transfer portal, they'd all, they'd all get a scholarship, but I don't know that they'd be the first pick of every team. You know what I mean? Like it's right. a great team, but they're playing with an unbelievable player who, who instills so much confidence and her ability to see the floor. And like you said, rise to the moment when she came out in the third quarter and hit three deep threes. And, you know, listening to uh, Kim Mulkey after, after the game, it's like, well, you know, what could, is there anything else you could have done to try to stop her? She's just like, no, you know, like you're not, you got, you got to try to defend everybody, you know, because. Well, people are, people are jumping over Kim Mulkey. Like, look, I'm no Kim Mulkey fan. Right. Let's, let's start there. But people are jumping over like, oh, she, she did a, her team did a horrible job defending. Like you don't guard people 40 feet no. from the hoop. You just don't. No. You want them to take a low Especially percentage Especially her, shot. Yeah. You know, who can go by, right. you know? And you know, she, what she just created. What I like about this women's game these days, like it's not, just, you, you know, the, you don't have to go back that far, Rick. You go back maybe 10 years and I covered some of these games. And I think so did you when the, when the women's final four was here that, when UConn was here, it was kind of it was kind of like UConn and everybody else, right. and it was that way for a long time. I mean, for for a good while, it was Tennessee and yeah, everybody exactly. else. Yeah, exactly. And then UConn uh, caught up, and then and then surpassed Tennessee, and then it was UConn and everybody else. And we were writing stories. I think I even wrote the columns. Rick, is UConn women's? Is it bad for women's basketball? Yeah, they're so dominant. They have, yeah, right. And I looking back now, it was pretty. It was a pretty. Those were bad columns <laughs> because I think it raised the level of play of everybody. Yeah. And now it's not just. Iowa and, and Caitlin Clark. I mean, it's Paige Beckers and UConn. Yeah. 
It's South Carolina, which might be the they may be the best team in the nation. Yeah. The best team in the nation, right? With Don Staley, and they have a terrific program. LSU, you could run those two teams back out tomorrow, Iowa and LSU, and LSU might win by eight. Agree. You know, Agree. so and then and then you have other players, Juju Watkins at USC, yeah. uh, and other programs that are that are coming on. UCLA's got a good program. Kansas State beat Iowa this year. Iowa's gone through a tough bracket, so it's the thing that it that I think is great is not it's not just one player, it's not just one team, it's several it's several players, several teams. And now I, I the big question I have now, Rick, is what happens now? Like Caitlin Clark's going to leave. Yeah. Now does that impact women's college basketball? I think not. I think there will still be enough interest in it. Does it impact the WNBA? I would like to think that it. I will think that's because, the biggest boost to, to all of this. I think the WNBA, I think so. uh, who could also get Angel Reese. Now, if Angel Reese comes back and plays at LSU, you've got your superstar returning to women's college basketball, um, right. and, and that's a possibility. I mean, you know, and the other thing we can talk about is is what NIL has done, you know, to keep all athletes in college longer because, frankly, sometimes there's not as much money once they become pro is, is what they're making now, you know, but no, I, I, I think that the college game will be looking for its next superstar, but here's, here's sort of the macro of it all, right? How many young women, girls, teenage girls, uh, preteen girls have right. watched, you know, Caitlin Clark and are out in the driveway, you know, mimicking her. And, and I can just picture, you know, a bunch of coaches and dads going, no, don't shoot from so far out, you know? And it's like, well, <laughs> Caitlin does it. And then, you know, her coach will tell you, yeah, she wasn't, she wasn't strong enough to launch from where she's launching now um, when she first started, but she had range and confidence. Um, but I think it, it's going to grow the game immeasurably because uh, of those 12.3 million viewers, there's a lot of moms and dads and, and daughters sitting there watching this. And saying, I think you hit, you hit on a great point, Rick, and it, and it really is the comparison is Steph Curry. I think so, and and it's and it's because of the way Steph Curry's changed the game. You know, we had a commercial when you and I were much younger. It was like be like Mike. Everybody wants to oh, be yeah. like Mike, and they're talking about Michael Jordan. Here's the problem: nobody could be like <laughs> no, Mike. no one. <laughs> like he, he because he played above the rim, and he played and he did things that that few other people could do. And when you watch the superstars of past eras. Like in 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 the NBA anyway, and in and in even in college basketball, men's college basketball, they played above the rim. Steph Curry made it cool to play below yeah, the did. rim. Steph Curry made it cool to play thirty feet from the basket and be a star and change the game. Right. And that's what Caitlin. You're right. That's what Caitlin Clark's doing. It's not the old, you know, jamming sorta, inside, that, get fouled, go yeah, to the line, jamming inside, kick it back outside, go to the line. Yeah. You know, maybe shoot a fifteen footer, yeah. twenty footer. Yeah. That was the range for everybody. Mm-hmm. And now Caitlin Clark has shown, like you watch these women's games, Rick, and I, I probably watched more women's college basketball the last couple of years because I, I really like watching Caitlin Clark. I like watching Paige Beckers now that she's healthy again. I like watching Angel Reese. I really liked watching Juju Watkins, and I think she's going to be fun to watch over the next couple of years if she stays. Like, it's a fun brand of basketball to watch. I don't think we could always say that about the women's game. There were a lot of times where it was a little too plodding, a little too robotic. They've changed the game. They and I think Caitlin Clark. I think you're right, Rick. There are girls who are watching that game. Girl, when I say girls, I'm talking about little girls. Yeah. Oh yeah. Who are watching the game? Who say, yeah, like you just said, they're out in the driveway, and and maybe there when there never was a basketball hoop there before. Now there is, and they're shooting from from way not downtown. The driveway. They're trying to shoot from the street. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, into the driveway. Yeah, just so. like just like the guys that followed Steph Curry. I mean, it, it's about the three pointer. It's about spreading the floor. And I think it's made for a better game because they're not all packed inside. You know, Rebecca Lobo was a phenomenal player, but if you got the ball down in the paint with her, there wasn't many people that could stop her without fouling, you know? Right. Um, and like I said, the game, the game is, is faster. Uh, not, there wasn't, what I liked about it is there wasn't an abundance of turnovers in this game. You know, at one right. point, Iowa was being out rebounded and they ended up with a big edge, which is all effort. Yep. Um, I thought it was terrific and, and great for not just great for women's basketball, which which will translate to the next level. The WNBA needs those ratings. They need help. Right. There's some teams that do OK. But on the whole, I, I think we forget about a lot of the women that go to that league. That won't be the case anymore. Yeah, that will not be the case. anymore. I, I think you're right. I think you're right. I think I think the next we're going to find out about the WNBA over the yeah, next five. years. Absolutely. Because that's really that's really a pivotal moment because 
if the WA, WNBA can't take Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese and Juju Watkins and raise their profile uh, and Paige Beckers and turn and and turn them into like like watch must see TV, then I'm not sure it's ever going to happen. Well, unfortunately, and you know what I yeah. also dig, and and of course me and you would have sort of arguments at times about this. Now I think the pendulum may have swung too far the other way because the genie is out of the bottle. But the NIL, you know, not only would you watch the other night Caitlin Clark, you know, just launching 35 footers and, and making them and putting her team in a lead, then they'd go to a commercial. And I swear to you, Tom, two of every three commercials was Caitlin Clark. Yeah. You know? Yeah. She does the state yeah. farm commercial. And yeah. I, you know, the other advantage, I think, too, and, and this is where NIL ultimately could help again. And again, we're going to sound like you're begging yeah, exactly. Day. But really, there was a time when, you know, you and I watched Bobby Hurley and Christian Leitner. And it seemed, I swear to, I swear that Christian Leitner played college basketball for 17 years. He was at Duke for 17 he was, years. He was. That's what along, it actually Along like, before him know? was Danny Ferry. He was there for 18 years. Danny Ferry was there for 17. I heard there was a guy a thousand years ago, but the only, only older people remember this name. There was a guy named Bill Paterno played at Notre Dame. I swear Bill Paterno played from 1963 to 1989, and he played college basketball for 27 years. And it, But here's the thing. Being serious now, like – the reason that that game on Monday night drew so many people, LSU, Iowa, is because these were the same two teams that played a year ago. Absolutely. The same two superstars. And people remember that game. It's just like I remember watching the UNLV uh, Duke game when Duke won the national title a year after UNLV absolutely destroyed them in the semifinal, like beat them, like embarrassed them bad in the final. And they came back the next year, I think, and beat them in the semifinals. It was the, you remember it because it goes year after year. It's what made the Carolina Duke rivalry so great because they played each other year after year after year. So maybe the NIL will help in some ways that guys will stick around, women will stick around a little bit longer to play college basketball, and we'll get to know them a little bit better. That'd be nice before they go to the NBA. It would be nice. Yeah, so. I think it's possible. Um, and I and I know it's happening in college football. You know, and you know right. maybe not this year. I think you know the number one pick is not going to stay at USC. He's going to go to the Bears, I believe. Although the reports are he made nine million dollars last year, so that's that's you know not much more than he'll be guaranteed uh, for four years as a as an NFL player. That said, um, I think rivalries. You hit it on the head. We love rivalries, and Duke was always you know back in their heyday that team, right? They were so good, and then and Shashevsky and the Dukies and all this that they became sort of villains, you know. In, in oh, the yeah. ACC and 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 elsewhere, partially because when you win, everybody wants to knock you off that perch, right? Sure. Um, but Iowa didn't win, and yet LSU played the villain. I don't know that they asked to necessarily. There's a lot of reasons why they were painted that way, and I think some of the things that Angel Reese did at the end of the game last year with the pointing to the ring on her finger and um. You know, sort of the I can't see you stuff, which, by the way, Caitlin Clark had done earlier. Right, right. Yeah, Caitlin Clark is maybe the biggest trash talker in college Unbelievable. basketball. Although I saw a poll the other day that Angel Reese barely edged out Caitlin Clark as the biggest yeah, trash so talker. So, I mean, they're 1A, 1B, right? Sure, exactly. And they here's the thing. They were both cool with it. Yeah. Like with the yeah. other. And I think, you know, and we'll get into what Reese said after the game, but I think that's good for sport. I think it's good for college basketball and women's college basketball um, because you have to have sort of a little bit of juice, you know, to those rivalries. And you don't want to see poor sportsmanship or, you know, all that stuff. Now, yeah, dirty play. Yeah, you know, you know, yeah, yeah, we don't want it to get out of hand. Uh, we don't need the Pistons, you know, going up in the stands or anything. But having said all that, I want your opinion on this. A couple things, um, and we'll get to what was written about LSU uh, during this tournament in a minute. But after the game, Angel Reese uh, was reflective, even tearful at times, talking about all the stuff, put it mildly, she's gone through, you know, since last year, since winning the national championship. Now, some of that stuff has been really lucrative, great stuff. Uh, and she wasn't necessarily complaining about her fame or her team or any of that. But there did ring sort of a 
you know, first of all, to the victor goes the spoils, right? Everything's great when you're winning, but when you lose, you got to own it, you know? Right. And, and I almost kind of felt like there was a little bit of victimhood. And I don't know that it's totally unwarranted, by the way, because I, I can't hear what people are yelling at her from the stands. I've not been to an LSU right. game. I don't know. And she talked about being sexualized and getting death threats. Already. I, I, there's never an excuse look, for that, ever. No, there's never an excuse for that. And, I, and I'm not sure that's what you're talking about No, I'm here. not. We're not talking, no, I'm not about talking that. We're just, death threats. And, you know, I don't, I don't, nobody yeah, can yeah. condone that. And, I, and No, and we have no idea what it's like to be uh, a black woman, you know. Absolutely who, not. And I'm sure there's, there's a, definitely a racial element. There has to be. This. You would, you would sure. imagine there is. Yeah. Um, right. But. She was honest enough to point it out. And, you know, I heard some takes that they ran the gamut on these on these talk shows of, you know, well, you know, you, you can't be doing this when you win and then and then complaining about your treatment when you lose. Right. And I guess some of that's fair, except I'm not sure that that's totally what she meant. You know, I don't know how deep. The insults cut. I don't know what she what it's like to be in her shoes every day in every court. Um, right. You know, we're all human at some level. Uh, the interesting thing is the amount of respect between teams and between those two players in particular, you know, who have played against each other long before they went to LSU and Iowa. You know, they've right. competed before. Um, I don't know if they've ever been on the same team or not, but they were very familiar with each other. And even in the post game you could tell the amount of respect that they each have, uh, which was also cool because that's what, that's what sport is about. Um, but I think, I think a lot of people got made a story sort of out of her reaction, to, you know, post game, which those things are always tough anyway, because you've just lost, right? You're not going back to the final four. She faces a big decision. She may be losing or leaving all her LSU teammates. So in that moment, yeah, you know, Rick, I, I'm, I'm, you're, I'm, I think I know what you're saying about that too. Look, we're going to quote you after a game, but at the same time, I don't know that we should take everything that you say five minutes after a game. Yeah. Um, serious or or as serious as as we would if you waited a day to say it. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that some of the things that people have said to her, some of the things that people have sent her, uh, you know, said about her on social media, sent her in emails, said to her, yelled from the court. I'm sure are the most disgusting things that you can imagine. And, and again, we're not talking about any of that stuff. No. Um, at the same time though, look, people don't like your, your program because they don't like your coach. That's part. I of think it, that's okay? part of it. And I think that's a big part of it. And, and Kim Mulkey seems to embrace some of that sometime, which is, I'm totally down with that too. Like I don't like Kim Mulkey and I don't think she cares that I don't no, like she her. does not. She doesn't care. She that does not. Now the other thing, and I there is a little bit of like, hey, you guys are gonna talk trash when you lose. People are gonna talk it back to you, and you can't turn around and say, "Oh, people are treating me mean," you know. Now again, the death threats. I'm not talking about that stuff, but just the general, nah, nah, go home, you're done, see you later. Like you're gonna get that back. You can't turn around and say, "Oh, that's not, that's not the way you should treat people," right? Because you do it to them. Yeah, you know. So, I look. I also got the same thing. Uh, it's funny. I got an email. I write, I've been writing a lot about Caitlin Clark in my pointer newsletter just because of the, the numbers. Yeah. And we call it the Clark effect, the TV numbers. And and somebody wrote me and just ripped Caitlin Clark up and down. Just ripped them. About what, though? Exactly. And so about she compl- she complains about she com- she, she whines and, too yeah. much. She complains about calls. She's always complaining. She yells at her teammates. She's she, and basically just the way she behaves on the court. Mm-hmm. And as it got on and on, and we went back and forth, and I'm like, "Well, how's that any different than 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 Jordan used to? Or that you know, Larry Bird was a, as big a trash talker as there ever was. Like, how's it say? Well, they went back, and then I found out the guy's from Nebraska, uh, and he's a huge Nebraska. Okay, fan. I'm like, ah, there we go. Yeah. So I think there's a little bit of that with LSU. Look, LSU won the national championship last year. Mm-hmm. You know who didn't like it? Every team that they played. You know, so there is a little bit of like as you mentioned a minute ago. You're the villain because you won. There's a little, there, there's that as well. You know, I mean, people hate Tom so, Brady to this I, day. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I do think a lot of it comes back to a that they're really good, yeah. and b it's it's uh there's it's a Kim Malky factor. A lot of people don't like Malky, but look, Rick, I'm not going to lie to you. There is a racial element to no this. No question. 
Um, you know, Caitlin Clark's white, Angel Reese is black. They had, there was this perceived, um, you know, sort of rivalry last year in terms of like how they felt about each other when there was nothing but respect. And then there was that article in the LA times, Mm -hmm. which was a, um, sort of painted LSU as, and I, and, I know where the writer was. I know what the writer was trying to do. He just failed miserably and at wrote it, a long sort apology of about it too. As a matter of fact, yeah, he did, and he had to because he was <laughs> he he needed to apologize yeah. for that column because it painted LSU. You know, you always want like sort of. It's easy to to paint like uh, you want a rivalry. Like you have this team is finesse and this team is power, and you, you try, try to, to contrast this team is this them. And yeah. this team is that. Exactly. So you look at Caitlin Clark, everybody, America's sweetheart. Everybody loves her. Everybody roots for Iowa. She's the hero of all these girls, you know, and then you got the bad guy, you know, and they painted LSU unfairly. You know, there are many, probably as many kids out there who look up to, to Angel Reese as they do Caitlin Clark and respect that the way she plays the game. Yeah. And she's won a national championship. So, so I, I understand why LSU felt like, Hey, this isn't, this isn't right. You know, it's kind of what happened with Rutgers a few years ago and the whole, you know, painting them as Don Imus getting in trouble. Like, it's so wrong. Like, just treat them like, like the people they deserve to be treated. It's one thing to root against the team. That's fine. But, you know, don't paint them out as bad people. That's the way it came off. Like, these are bad people. Not that you don't like them as a team or as, like, the same thing happened with, you know, with, I think a little bit of Duke that happened with Duke where, like we didn't like them as players, but we no one was saying that Christian Leitner was a bad guy, right. or that Danny Hurley was a bad person. Shashevsky's another story. <laughs> People don't like Shashevsky, but um, I just think it's when we when we start to think that we know these people. I don't know. Maybe that's a step forward in a in a weird sort of way for college basketball, women's college basketball. That I'm getting emails, people complaining about. Caitlin Clark's behavior if on the it court? Sells, I don't know. Would they do it about a man? Yeah, uh, maybe. If it sells. I don't know, that's why I wrote back to this guy and I'm like, did you complain about Kobe? Because Kobe did the same thing. There you stuff, go. You know. There you go. And I and I and Jordan and Bird. You've written that. a lot of these columns, right? Where you have to take a position and maybe maybe it's one you're trying to show contrast, you know, between one team and another, or one player and another. I don't think the term dirty debutantes would ever be something that you would get by your filter. Uh, no. I think if you just look that up, it's probably one you don't want to use. And I'm all for yeah, alliter- I'm for all sure. for alliteration, but that was that. And that's what the writer was yes, going for here. Yeah. But and I understand how was... you could get there, maybe. Um, but it was poor taste, and he and he paid for it, and it was it was, uh, you know, it was absurd. Now, as far as, far as Malky goes, um, you know, there was this run up to the Washington Post story, where they anticipated it was coming out, and she predicted it was a hit job which by the way i'm not sure it was uh it was not i'm sure she took it very personal but she actually put more eyeballs on that product before it was even written um and and so she did a couple of things here i thought because a lot of people read the story and said there was that's a nothing burger yeah nothing there was nothing in it now i totally disagree i thought it was a really well written profile and it's not as if the washington post promised like Hey, we're about to come out with a piece that's gonna bury. Oh, no, they Kim never Malky. said that. They right. It was Kim Malky who said that. Like they're about to come out with a piece that I'm gonna sue them mm-hmm. for. Yeah. And you know, she she of course brought a lot of attention to it, but at the same time, she set it up. And I don't even, I don't think she did it on purpose. I don't know. Maybe she's crazy like a fox. I don't know. But maybe she set it up. Um, I don't think she. I don't think she did though. To set it up to say like this, there's a bad story coming about me, and you shouldn't read it. And then once we did read it, it was like, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's and all you called was. attention to it. But I actually, that was a really good story. It really gave me a lot of insight. There was a lot of, in there that I didn't know about her. Now there was a lot that we did know about her, and it was a lot of like, you know, how does she feel about players? You know, it sort of made some uh, allegations about how she, at least from other people, saying she asked players to sort of downplay their sexuality if they were gay yeah, don't ask don't tell um, kind of that's the whole the whole right the whole britney griner like how did she feel about britney griner she really didn't step up for her while britney griner was in russia that's one of her former players at baylor mm-hmm. um so and and there are play, people who had bad relationships with her just like there were people who had i'm sure bad relationships with bob knight or another you know fiery any other fiery coach that you can think of so i don't know i actually thought it was a really well written story 
Um, she probably wasn't crazy about some of the stuff involving her dad. You yeah, know, there's some family, family stuff, and she's got some relationship issues. You know what? So does Aaron Rodgers. You know. Um, yeah. So does a lot I, of people I, I in his life. So does everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, my kids probably will have that with me um, at some level. Hopefully not, where we're estranged. But you know, you never know how, how I'm going to screw them up. It's possible. Um, but no, I. You know, it's one of those things. And I guess when you're writing those, Tom, I guess. Do you constantly tell yourself, is this fair? Like, what was your approach to like, was it just what you thought? And maybe you, maybe what you're writing is what you believe, right? I would hope, I would well, hope the, that was the case. But. Yeah, no, I, that, the, I'm glad you mentioned that because you and I used to talk about this when we did, when we did a radio show yeah. at WDAE and we, there was never any fake, fake outrage. We never took a stance that we didn't actually believe in. Yeah. And I can say, and I think I can speak for you too. I've never written anything just to get an get a reaction right 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 right. i've never said like you know what i actually think this guy should be fired but i'm gonna argue that he should stay yeah. be the be the and contrarian like, and people call that clickbait yeah. and i don't even know what that means to this day because i don't know who reads my stories so you know but that would well i hope i people do read my story so yeah i'm right yeah <laughs> but i it's meant as an insult and i also i just i i think it's hard to keep your story straight if you if you're changing your stance you know every time mm-hmm. you know so my, I've always felt like, okay, I'm going to write what I actually believe, but there is, there are moments, Rick, where you do have to remind yourself, and I'm sure you run into this all the time, that these are people that you're writing. Yeah. About. Like it's easy to forget that. And it's particularly easy to forget it. If you're writing about people that you don't really know, or you don't see on a daily basis. So if I were writing about or right here, we're talking about Kim Mulkey. And I just said a a little while ago, I don't like Kim Mulkey, just based on some of the things she said, some of the things she's done in press conferences and her attitude towards COVID and all that sort of thing. That's what I don't care for her about. But if I covered her every day and I saw a different side of her, would I feel differently? Yeah, prob- maybe. I don't know. Like John Tortorella is a guy that people are like, oh, you must have. You must have couldn't stand covering. I loved covering John Totorell. I thought he was great to cover, and I had a good relationship relationship with him. I'm sure there were people, Rick, that 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 you covered who, like, you know, looked at you and said, "Oh, I, you must not have been able to stand that guy." Like Sap, Sap, somebody who could be difficult to deal with. And you had a pretty decent relationship with Sap, though. Yeah, right? I still do. I mean, there, believe me, there were days we called it the dangling hand when you go over there, and especially people from out of town that he didn't know. And they go to shake his hand his, on his bench at the old one buck place, and he just let it look at them. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're, you're going to deal with that with professional athletes all the time. Uh, you know, you wrote, and, and I think age is part of this too, right? Kim Kim Mulkey's a grown woman. She makes millions of dollars coaching women's basketball. Okay, and she's got a whole right. career and pattern of where she got here, how she got here, who she's about, right? All of that. So a profile on her is one thing. Do you have the same sort of scrutiny for a 21 year old or a 23 like you wrote, you wrote a column and i i thought it was a good column about Jameis winston some offensive things that he said at an elementary school uh that mm-hmm. appeared to be sexist in nature telling the girls to sit down i don't want to lose the context here um but yeah the gr- girls are supposed to be silent, yeah quiet, but you were very cr- you were yeah. very critical um but you know you can't i mean there's certain things you just can't stand there at the plate and, and take a ball. You know what I mean? Like, you, you know, you, you, you got to call them out on it when you do, because I think even though we're, we're all maturing at a different rate, sometimes you're still the face of a franchise. You're still a quarterback in the national football league. Like I think status and age also play into this somehow, if that makes sense. Oh, I absolutely agree. And I, and I think though, you talk, you go back to fairness. And I, I'd always bring this up. Like, and there are a lot of people to this day who are still upset with me that I wrote that yeah. column about Jameis and what he said at the school without realizing a couple of things. Number one, like I pointed out in that column, look, he did not have to be there that no. day. He was his day That's off right. and he was spending time with yep. kids. You know, uh, he could have been home playing video games. He could have gone to the beach. Right. He could have done whatever he, he well pleased yep. and no one would have known or had a problem that he wasn't spending his off day at a That's school right. with kids. So I gave him credit for that. Here's the other thing, Rick, out of all, out of everybody, out of that entire story, only one person on planet Earth reached out to him and and asked what was going through your mind when you said that, and that was me. Mm. I called and I and I got his and there's a quote in that column from him about what he said, which by the way he apologized. Yeah, for. he did. So there is a fairness about it. like 
if I would have sat there and and just taken nothing but ch- you know cheap shots, right. and, and this is what we're talking about, like how do you treat yeah. players? And look, there was a little bit of you know, Jameis. This wasn't the first time there were questions about. He came into the league with questions about attitudes. He came into questions, yeah, about you know involving women, and so this was that had something else had to do. It's context, yeah. Right now, like again, we talked about. I think there are times, and in, in, in context is a perfect word, Rick. And you've dealt with this, and I've dealt with this. There are times where you go into a locker room right after a tough loss, and yeah, sometimes you might give an athlete a benefit of a doubt of saying, like, "Look, he's really emotional yeah, right now. Absolutely. She's really emotional right now." Like Angel Reese the other night. Like I thought her words were very powerful. I did too. You know, and what she said was disturbing. Quite yeah. frankly, not disturbing that she said it. Disturbing that these things happened. Yes. To her. Um, and so, but you know, or the, the other night or Juju Watkins, like walked off the floor in tears and really didn't shake the hands of, I mean, she shook the hands of the UConn players, but really didn't look him in the eye and hug him and all that stuff. And I saw some criticism, like, Oh, look at her, the poor loser. Like she's 19 years old, 18, 19 years yeah. old and just lost a game to go to the final four. I'm going to cut her a little bit of a break. Yeah. Here, you know, I mean, the Detroit Pistons so. walked right by Michael Jordan and the entire bulls bench one time. Uh, and, and they don't and get they're a pass. professionals. You know why? Because those guys were professionals, and they were thirty years Which old. They knew better, and they had won before, yeah. and they were and they were the bad boys. Name they, they embraced that stuff anyway. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. So I, it's a good topic. It really it's a is. Good topic. Con- context yeah. matters, and I thought the Wapo story was more of a profile, and and maybe you know if 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 she, Kim Mulkey could have designed the profile, she may not have included some of her family issues. She may have had a different. A different pet, but you know what? Here's the other thing that's true with our with with writing those things. They gave her two years to respond, and then yeah. then when they sent her questions, ten questions, and she said, "Oh, now I'm entering the tournament, and I now I just get ten questions." No, you had two years. They've been trying to get you respond for you this. had two years, and you also it gave you forty eight. You wrote a four page memo to, to telling everybody what happened. Right. In a statement, when you could have answered the twelve email right. questions that they sent you, instead of going out and hiring the best defamation lawyer, yeah, lawyer in the country, which I don't think he no, did, but I think yeah, you were just saying sabering, that rattling, yeah, rattling sabers. And uh, somebody asked me that the other day. Like, I did get an email about this. Like, hey, what about the timing of this? Saying did they wait for the tournament? I'm like, I don't know, but all, there are more eyes on women's college basketball right now, so it, it is a timely event. You're not, you know, Tigers coming to town to play the the Valspar. I'm not going to write about it a month ahead of time. I'm going to write about it today. Or a here, month, or you know, a month so. after. I mean, I think people fail to fail to understand <laughs> exactly. that this is a business, and you want eyeballs on your work. Um, but maybe they could have written it a year earlier if she'd have responded too. You know, um, right? I, I got a. This was one the other day. I got a. I got an email, and there was there was some discussion about sixty minutes to the just to go off sports for yeah. a second. Sixty minutes to the profile of Marjorie Taylor Green, and then there was another story i was at the washington i want to say the washington post but i may be it may have been in the new york times i can't remember um did a profile of uh lauren bobert the congresswoman from um from colorado controversial congresswoman and people are saying why are you writing about these these people giving them giving them oxygen to spread some of the things that they mm-hmm. say and i'm like you know what there were things that i loved i read the lauren bobert profile and i'm like wow there were things in that profile that i did not know about her and it didn't make me any more sympathetic or make me like her any more or less. It may have made you understand, but it made me understand who she is. her a little. Yeah. And I, and I, here's the thing: I read that Kim Mulkey thing, and I look. I know I knew about the Kim Mulkey stuff when it came to Brittany Griner. Yeah. I I had heard their their stories have always been out there about her sort of her some of her conservative um, value, values, opinions. Harvey, yeah, you she doesn't hide it. those. Right, but. But some of the stuff with her dad and all, like I didn't know any of that. I didn't know her family background, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, no. And so I don't. Now does that make me like her more or less? I, I don't know, but I understand her a little bit better. Well, your you story know, is so. your story, no matter how much we'd like to edit the, the bad parts. And when you're a public figure and a successful one, you know there's a reason why you're in a very high profile business that 12.3 million people want to watch your games, and you get rewarded handsomely for it. It comes with the territory. It just does. Well, and that's I th- I'm sure, Rick. You get a lot of that where it's like, "Hey, this is none of your business." Oh, all the Why time, are you yeah. into this. And look, there's one thing. Let me make something clear, and and you'll back me up on this. If I if we wrote everything oh that we knew God. about every single player, 
like you would be stunned. I'd have to you wait until stunned. everyone was dead or I was <laughs> on my deathbed because I'm quite certain and not many people talk to me now. I know no one would talk to me again. But here's the thing. If I if it affects their performance, it if it affects their standing in a community, if it affects um how they play the game, yeah, like those I think are fair. How game. about if it's factual? Well, it's factual too. But look, there I I covered here. Look, I covered players we all have. back I know what in you're the day. Say. Okay, where I've been, I've gone out at late at mm-hmm. night to have a few beers after a yep. game. You saw and some behavior. Came back to a hotel yeah. and saw saw athletes with women who were not their wives mm-hmm. <laughs> leaving the hotel. Right. Now, do I care? Is that any of my business? No, I never wrote those yeah. things. No, if players out constantly and he's out at you see him at you know five thirty in the morning when you're on your way to the airport and they're just coming in yeah. and they also play poorly. Mm-hmm. Is it now fair game to say, hey, this guy's staying out late? He's not. He's. I don't know. Maybe that is fair game. No, we don't have to say what he was doing out late. We're just saying this is a guy who's who's partying too much. I don't know. You know, it's we rarely wrote those stories, but this idea that we're constantly. Uh, in the personal lives of athletes, so they, they get a lot of room. They get a lot of room from us yeah. um, because it doesn't affect their play. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it, you know, it is, some of it is none of our business. Like a guy's relation, you know, last year got weird. Two years ago, got weird with the whole Brady Giselle thing. I'm sure you had to navigate. Oh, well, yeah, there was very right few, were, very little of it. We could actually write because short of a document or him actually talking about it or her, it was speculation. It was good speculation, as it turned out. But yeah, I think. Well, and it wasn't finger pointing. Like a lot of plenty of people have been through divorces, separations, like, all kinds of things. We get that. Like people will understand that stuff. Like, but is that? I don't know. And the answer is I don't know. I'm not saying. Well, there is. I think like, when the player, if the guy's going out and not playing well, when the and, player loses 25 pounds in front of your very eyes, and he misses 10 days of training camp, um, there becomes like, is this, you know. Is, is is his personal life affecting his play on the field? And I think I think right. that's a fair question. But you have to get that from somebody else, you know. Right, and it's not like we go in. Well, the reason here's the reason why their no, marriage is suffering. No. It's not about that, but it's like, look, he is having a personal yeah, issue. Yeah, which he finally admitted. And he it, goes, look, I'm. And here's why he's not I'm here. Forty five. Yeah. I got a lot of bleep going on, and that's as close to he came as you know, as revealing. And then, you know, let the New York Post and others with different standards write what they want to write, but. Um, yeah, that's something right. we struggle with all the time. And believe me, I've talked to more lawyers in the last four years than I care to care to ours in particular uh, that I care to spend any time on. So it's an interesting topic and, and uh, people should check out your column on pointer.org, uh, your daily newsletter. Uh, it's a must read in, in the industry, outside the industry. You, you talk about sports, you talk about media, you talk about politics, everything. And uh, you've been doing it for a long time now since uh, your days as a columnist with the Tampa Bay Times. Let's do this again, only I'll keep you a little shorter next time. This was this, we that no we worries. Just, we start talking about Caitlin Clark went, and man. Angel Reese. It's like you know, isn't it great to talk about college? I could talk about Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. I love all day. it. It was so fun. it was so I wish they could play best of five, best of seven. Yeah, and I'd watch those two go at it over and over and over. And I wish this had somehow made it to the to the final four. I wish this could be for all the marbles, you know, rather than who got to the final four, but that's just the way it is with seedings. And I tell you, what, I got news for you at Paige Beckers and, and UConn. Oh, might it's going to be good. Clark yeah. Iowa. It's going to be good. I mean, you, and then both, and then whoever wins that game might lose. The they South might, Carolina. they might, this thing is a long way from over. Um, and NC state's like, whoa, whoa, whoa we're in yeah, there. What about us? We're playing too. Yeah. So yeah. we got a lot more. I'll to tell go. you what about you. I think you're, I think you're going to get, <laughs> I think they're, I think they're out. But it's pretty wild. You, NC State men and women. Both yeah. Them. No, and, and and NC State men, you talk about a journey. They had to win like something like nine games. They had a miracle shot in the ACC tournament, which they then had to win to make it into the tournament. And now they're in the Final Four. It's an incredible. I keep seeing Jim Valvano in my head running around the court. Well, that's the last time. This reminds me so much yeah. of that 83. It's the team. last time, 1983, when that they have been. Survive in advance. It, Survive in advance. That's it, you know. Uh, what was it? Wittenberg puts up the shot, and you know, uh, and, and you know they, they grab it and throw it in at the buzzer. Renzo Renzo Charles, Charles, I think yeah. J- j- hey, thanks for joining us. We'll, we'll do this again real quick tomorrow.